Brethren, even if a person is caught doing something wrong, you who are spiritual, instruct such a one in a spirit of meekness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear faithful, words coming to us, of course, from today's epistle. Very recently, and just in the last actual couple, last week or two, uh, for uh, Father McGuire and myself, on separate occasions, had totally separate run-ins with the common Feniite problem. Uh, for those who don't know, the, a Feniite is, is a heretic who follows the error of Father Leonard Feeney, a Jesuit from Massachusetts, uh, who denied the baptism of blood and desire, and he was excommunicated for that for that crime. Well, it's a kind of a, a plague that affects uh, traditionalism today, and each of us had a very interesting experience in in this in this coming across this world of the, of the Fenians. For myself, <clears throat> I had met this young uh, young man uh, who had uh, who had come to the mass uh, one Sunday, and he wanted to sit down and talk about the, this aspect of the faith that the. And so I did. I sat with him, and we talked for a long while about not just this issue, but several different issues, and um, really talked for hours ad nauseum, fighting against the Feniite position for him to prove the things that he was bringing up as to be, you know, to explain the Catholic position on baptism of the blood and desire. And, you know, while contentious at the time, you know, we went away fairly amicable, but I had my doubts as to any kind of resolution in his mind because, especially coming from Massachusetts, I've dealt with it a lot over the years. And sure enough, a few days later, I get an email from the, the gentleman, and he has written this 17-page uh, long argument trying to bring up the same arguments that we had gone over you know, already again and again in conversation. And in it, he was, quote-unquote, destroying the, the ideas of baptism of blood and desire. And he ends it with saying that, in all charity, I have to tell you that you must change your belief on this or you will go to hell. I thought that was a very interesting way of wrapping things up from a 23-year-old talking to a Catholic priest. But anyways... Well, Father McGuire ran into a very similar situation, not actually dealing with the Feniac himself, but a person who had encountered one. And that uh, woman had talked to this person who, who argued long about this, this heresy, and to the point where she stood there and told this other woman, the Catholic woman, that I must tell you, quote, in all charity, that you're parents are both burning in hell because they, they had not been baptized, and for certain, they are definitely lost souls. And it caused a great disturbance, of course, in the soul of this poor woman. And so Father McGuire had to explain to her the Catholic position again there to bring some calmness back to her. But it was interesting, and it's not uncommon for these people, that they, that they close out their arguments by some sort of general attack, but under the blanket of the, that idea of charity, a quote-unquote charity in correcting those who they are talking to. But for us as Catholics, we have to see that some, while we can't dismiss the idea of fraternal correction, we have to recognize that those type of corrections that they were given were not actual fraternal corrections at all, but rather something totally falsely charitable and totally masking the grave sin of pride, the grave vice of pride that they possessed. But at the same time, we know fraternal correction is necessary at times. So how do we provide fraternal correction? How do we understand fraternal correction in the true realm of charity, in where our Lord wants it, and not some offshoot, uh, you know, very far fringe type of people who, who lack charity. Well, we have to understand fraternal correction itself. Fraternal correction, first and foremost, 
has its very basis in the true virtue of charity. And, and any time we think that we are either bound to give fraternal correction or we receive correction, we should always come back to that point. True correction is founded in the virtue of charity. What is charity? Of course, charity is defined by our Lord in the Scriptures as loving God with our whole hearts, minds, bodies, and souls, and loving our neighbor as ourself for the sake, for God's sake. And that true love of neighbor sometimes can only be had by means of correcting a fault in another. And that does oftentimes happen that we are required to do so. For instance, it would be cruel to let a blind man who is wandering through the wilderness and walking towards a precipice, a cliffside, it would be, it'd be wrong for us to let him fall off the cliff because of his own ignorance of the danger that's there when we stand there and we could help him, we could stop him from doing so. That would be, be uh, in a natural plane, fraternal and correcting him. Well, how much more so when we see somebody walking off the eternal precipice, the spiritual danger, how much more so are we required when we see that we can to be able to provide a correction to help them avoid that danger. But we are not required to rebuke somebody all the time. This brings That's the second point of fraternal correction. While at times we are required to correct, we are not always required to correct. Uh, this oftentimes, when we correct in times when we shouldn't, causes more harm than any kind of good that may come from it. Uh, for, and the, the general rule for that is that we should only provide a correction when we actually see a possibility of it being effective, when we see a real possibility for it to be effective in the life of the person. Um, if, uh, as, a, as a point of an example, if we are at work and we're working with a, a co-worker and they're just a general worldling type of person and something goes really badly at work and they are become very angry and they start going off on a tirade about the problem that they have and in that tirade they start using profanity and they use our Lord's name in vain, that is not the time to provide fraternal correction about using our Lord's name in vain. That's not the time to provide fraternal correction about not being uh, giving in to anger. No good is going to come of that. No fruits are going to be born in those situations because the man is already angry. He's already lost his cool. And any kind of correction being made is only going to pour gasoline on that fire of the passions. And so in that moment, we're not required to make any kind of correction because we don't think that the fruits will come from it. We also don't want to overly correct. We don't want to correct and nitpick at every little aspect of somebody's life, because then the person will reject our corrections on whole, rather than accepting them when we need to, when we were really required to give them on, on a, a matter of, of serious importance. So we, at times, are required to correct but not every time. Before correcting, we should also check, check that our own intentions are true, that our own intentions are pure, uh, that we're not correcting out of a point of, uh, of hurt feelings or, or pride, in any kind of way, that we're not correcting out of anger, that we're not correcting out of some sort of passion. Because at this, it's lost. Oftentimes, we might be providing correction when we don't need to. And another point to it is that we lose an aspect of the, the objectiveness of the correction. The correction is there for the, for the amendment of the individual. <laughs> And if we are only doing it because so-and-so, you know, humbled me by correcting me, and now I'm 
really, you know, I need to, to point out something, one of his faults so I don't have to reflect on my faults. Well, then the whole entire idea of it is coming from a bad place and the correction will be fruitless. Or if we are just really, really frustrated at our day and perhaps your children do something small that set you off and you, you know, yell at them out of just pure frustration, while some aspect of the correction may come through because maybe they did need to be corrected, a lot of the message gets lost because inherently they just know it's not coming from a place of, of, uh, of reason, but a place of frustration. And so reason and action of the will is always needed to be the guiding hand in any kind of correction that is given. Our passions uh, cannot rule us, but rather that of our will. We should also check that um, when we are correcting somebody, that we should be the ones to correct them. It's not our place to correct a child for misbehaving in a grocery store when their parent is perhaps standing right there in the same aisle and just didn't witness what they were doing. It's not our spot to come up and, and scold the child, but we can bring it to the attention of their parent, and they can correct the child in that situation. Because that is the authority figure in the child's eyes, and that is the one who would be most effective in providing that correction. Or if we know that, that a certain person reacts badly if I say something, but he has another friend who, who of, like, of like Christian mind as myself, if he were to provide the correction, it would go much more smoothly in the acceptance aspect of it. Then we should ask that person, perhaps, to provide the correction because the fruits being born would be much more uh, great. So check to see if I should be the one providing the correction. At times, there is nobody else. At times, it's up to us or nobody at all. And so even if we might not be the, the necessarily the best one, we might be the only one, um, but sometimes it's better left in the hands of another. Correction should be made as kindly as possible. As the epistle talks of today, that, that we correct in, in meekness, that we, we do so in as most charitable way as possible. Remember where fraternal correction comes from, not only the virtue of charity, but even brought down again, to the points of the corporal works of mercy, the corporal and spiritual works of mercy there, that you know we should admonish the sinner and instruct the ignorant. The works of mercy don't say to scream like a banshee at the sinner or to beat about the head the ignorant, but rather to admonish and to instruct. And so for us, we should always default ourselves to the lowest degree necessary of, of, uh, of sternness in our correction. Contrary to the motto of various military groups, most especially the Marines, not every problem is solved by high explosives. Harsh correction is appropriate at times, but most often it is much better to instruct in a kind way to attract them towards towards sanctity, to attract them towards right living and right actions, rather than to force them in that direction by a harsh word. Remember, we are here to attract, not to attack. <clears throat> Lastly, correction should always be made at the lowest level of involvement as possible. I don't mean that in our instruction we use as few words as we, as we possibly can get away with, but what I mean is that at its lowest level of correction it should be done. Our Lord tells us this in the scriptures when he tells us that first correct somebody yourselves, then if he does not amend, then bring it to the, you know, correct him in front of one or two witnesses. And then, if he still is obstinate, then bring it to the high priest. Then bring it to an authority figure to provide the correction. And so for us, it has to be that same way. Don't do it in a public 
way when we, that can be avoided. You're going to embarrass the individual. You're going to shame them. And perhaps they're going to not accept the correction well because of the fact that they can't get past their own feelings of shame or embarrassment. Don't do that as well because we have a duty to protect a person's good name. Remember when we were talking about the Ten Commandments that a good name is possessed just like any material possession. And we don't have a right to take that away unless absolutely unavoidable. So our correction should always be provided at the lowest level possible and only brought up to a higher, more public level if necessary. Our Lord, throughout the scriptures, tells us that in correction, that it should be done as individual and in charity. Never does he tell us to create a blog to send somebody's faults all throughout the world to see. In giving, if we are to be able to give fraternal correction well, we also have to be understanding enough of fraternal correction to accept it well. And how do we do that? First is that while when we talk about for our own actions, which I'm in control of, I control how I say something. I'm control, I control whether I say something. I control the words that come out of my mouth. But I don't control the words that come out of another's mouth. I don't control if they say something. I don't control how they say it or in what forum they say it. But I can only control how I receive that. And fraternal correction should be received in a spirit of gratitude and humility. We're only human. Our weaknesses are there, and they're going to come out in the form of, of protecting ourselves because fraternal correction doesn't feel great. It's not, they're not correcting you on something that you've done well. They're correcting you on, for doing something wrong. And so our reaction is oftentimes to immediately put up defenses, immediately to, to justify ourselves, to immediately look past the issue at hand in order to mitigate that feeling of wrongdoing on our part. But it's that little bit of humility that will help us to change our lives, to help us to grow in grace. And it doesn't usually feel nice, but that's okay. And we have to put aside that reaction because we know that it's usually based in our pride. Also, we have to look to the fact that the person saw a reason to bring it to our attention in the first place. That person felt it uh, felt strongly enough to actually say something that we have to self-reflect on it because we are not the best witnesses to our own faults. In fact, we are probably the worst witnesses to our faults many times because of the fact that I inherently want to defend myself and justify myself. And so even if they are wrong in a particular matter, say someone corrects me on on point, and they had completely missed the, the, what was actually happening there, it doesn't mean there's not some sort of lesson still to be gained from that. It doesn't mean there's not some sort of point of growth that I can accept in that correction in order to grow. For instance, to give a simple example that happened recently, there's a woman at St. Gertrude's when I was back there, and I came in one morning after, uh, into the sacristy, and she was there to do a little bit of work. And I walked into the sacristy, totally unassuming, and it was a, a Monday morning. And the person said to me, no hello, no greeting of any kind, no warmth in her voice whatsoever. Father, you need to be louder when you say Mass. That was it. And then, boom, back around the corner again. And I sat there thinking to myself, okay. And there was no thought given to the fact that that Sunday I had two public masses to say and four sermons to give on that day. And so you have to temper your voice a little bit so you don't lose it by the end of the day. There was no thought given to the fact that she was an elderly woman and probably doesn't have the greatest of hearing and that she also usually sits in the very far back of church. None of that crossed her mind. But does it mean that I'm always loud enough when I'm saying a public mass on a Sunday with a full church 
at a place like St. Gertrude's. No, it doesn't. Because perhaps there are times when I'm not projecting loudly enough. Perhaps there are times when I can be a little more conscious of that to try to, 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 to say it in the most proper way given the crowd at hand, according to the rubrics. And in that type of reflection, despite the delivery of the correction, despite the source of the correction, despite the fact that in that instance there probably really wasn't a problem, I still can gain a greater knowledge of myself and a greater awareness of areas where I can improve because we have to accept those corrections as they come and look for the lesson to be learned. In the end of it all, we all need to work at saving our own souls. But the same reason why I'm here to preach for you all, the same reason why we give catechism instruction, is the same reason why fraternal correction exists. It's because we can't just make it on our own. We can't always solve our own life problems or our own spiritual issues. Sometimes we need that help from outside, whether we ask for it or someone volunteers it to us. And sometimes we have to be the ones to give the assistance in that mode of fraternal correction. But we always have to reflect on where it comes from. It has to come from a point of true charity. It has to come from a point of truly looking out for the good of another soul. It has to come from a point that we think will bear the most fruit, to be the most effective, the most effective means of aiding someone in providing that little bit of change in their life that might bring them to that next step along the way in seeking after salvation. That has to be our goal in providing correction. And that's what we have to look for when we receive it. And if all of us have that mode, then we will all continually aid each other along that pathway to get closer to God and to get closer to our end goal, which is the salvation of our souls. May God bless you in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit.